Choosing Life, a short Dvar Torah for Parashat Shmot. In the opening chapter of Sefer Shmot, the Israeli people do what they do both best and worst. They multiply. How do I know they excel at this? Because to this day, Israel has the highest birth rate in the OECD. For over a decade, Israel leads the OECD countries by a significant margin. And what makes them incompetent? We just finished Sefer Bereshit, where infertility is almost a prerequisite for marrying one of the patriarchs. Perek Aleph of Shemot presents the first example of anti-Semites considering the Israeli womb a problem that needs containing. For the Israelites were fertile and prolific and became exceedingly numerous, filling the land, and all Paro's attempts to stop this relentless tide came to naught. In despair, the Egyptian king turns to the Hebrew midwives and orders them to make sure baby boys don't survive childbirth. The midwives disobey the royal decree, but what's interesting is the explanation they provide. For the Hebrew women are unlike Egyptian women, for they are chayot. They give birth before the midwife can come to them. The question we will explore is, what does chayot mean? Despite the fact that in rabbinic language, chaya became a synonym for a midwife, the only biblical source we have for this is right here. This fact is accentuated by Onkelus' translation, where midwives are chayata, but chayot are wise. So Rashi's Pshat interpretation, skillful like midwives, chayotena, is kind of interesting. Although to be fair, he too seems aware of this and offers the additional drash interpretation of comparing them to wild animals. Although many commentators have interpreted the word chayot in various ways, I believe the rest can be divided into two main categories, those who ascribe an intellectual trait and those who ascribe a physical trait. Among the intellectual school, we already mentioned Unkelus' wisdom and Rashi's proficiency or skill. We can add the Targum Yerushalmi that explains they were agile and wise, Rasag that says they were suspicious, Midrash Lekach Tov that teaches they were righteous, and Rabbi Yosef Bechor Shol, who argues they could identify anyone trying to harm them. To this group, one should add the Orachayim HaKadosh, but I believe his words warrant an honorable mention. The intellect, or in his words, the Haskala that was unique to the Hebrew woman, was twofold. Hebrew intellect and Egyptian intellect, or in my understanding, traditional intellect and scientific intellect. This combination turns the Hebrew midwife into a force to be reckoned with, especially for one who lacks either of these two intellects. The group of commentators who offer physical interpretations include Rashbam, who explains they were healthy, Ben Ezra, who endows them with healthy hearts, Abarbanel, who says they make an effort to properly care for their children, nurturing and sustaining them, Rashar Hirsh, who argues they were full of energy, unlike the Egyptians, and therefore they can give birth alone, and Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, who says Chayot refers to the living child and not to the birthing mother. And although it seems the commentators have already said it all, I think I have something small to add or at least mention. All the interpretations pointed to a famous choice that Hashem gives the Israeli nation every day. The command, Uvacharta b'chaim, therefore choose life. This choice, taking into account the neighborhood we live in, distinguishes us from our neighbors and is ingrained in our DNA even before the commandment. It enabled the barren matriarchs to continue hoping despite their infertility, the Hebrew women to continue giving birth despite the decree, and the Hebrew midwives to continue delivering despite the danger, and the Israeli nation to continue living despite anti-Semitism. Le'ilui nishmat, my beloved and heroic student, who was full of life, Amichai Shimon, ben Ishai and bat Yaru ben Hashem ikom damo, Jovi Holtz, one who loves life and Tanakh.